I apologize. Uh, this is work that was done really a year ago, but the dynamics of the, of the virus were such that uh, uh, those of us who, who didn't have a natural uh, uh, place to go found ourselves uh, working with whomever we could. And, and uh, I was working with some mathematicians. And so I didn't think about this. Uh, what's involved here um, is uh, goes back to a paper of, 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 of Dirk. Can you see my little arrow when I move it on the? Yes. 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 So I'm pointing to a paper here of Crimer, uh, which is an old paper. Uh, physicists never look at old papers, but mathematicians do. Uh, this one goes back to 1991, and basically. Uh, it uh, talks about the amplitude for two loop, two loop graphs. Um, and from this, uh, this, this paper had really a, a lot of influence in my, in my thinking, uh, but not necessarily in the way that I think Dirk would have, would have uh, wanted it to. Uh, basically, um, the, the takeaways, uh, the first takeaway, which I, I think is, is, is worth keeping in mind when you talk to a mathematician, is you want to convey uh, what's interesting to physics. And the takeaway, which was conveyed by that paper, was that two loops are already an interesting uh, physical problem. That is the amplitude for two loop graphs uh, is an interesting uh, physical problem. And, and so I add to that the fact that the algebraic geometers love cubic hyperservices. Cubic hyperservices, is, it's a little bit like the, the story of uh, uh, Goldilocks and the three bears. I mean. Uh, degree two hypersurfaces are, are too cold and degree four hypersurfaces are for many, many purposes too hot. But degree three hypersurfaces are just right. And, and uh, when a mathematician, an algebraic geometer feels they can do something uh, with a cubic hypersurface. So uh, even though the story is complicated, it's, it's, it's approachable. Um, the second uh, takeaway, um, which uh, uh, is a natural thing for an algebraic geometer to do. We're dealing with the second semantic. We're dealing with uh, uh, the, the amplitude as a, as a function of uh, external uh, parameters uh, like masses and momenta. Um, and uh, the physicist immediately wants to specialize to uh, the situations of interest and being physicists, they know the situations of interest. But mathematicians have no idea which configurations of masses and momenta are of physical interest. And uh, so the natural thing for a mathematician to do, particularly an algebraic geometer, is to take generic uh, parameters, uh, which has a, actually a technical meaning, but, but it's kind of obvious. Uh, and when you take generic uh, parameters, uh, for example, um, uh, I will be talking about the, 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 the double box. So let's see if I can find the double box here. Uh, yeah, there it is up in the, up in the upper left corner there. Uh, my double box is going to have external momenta uh, in the middle, uh, which I don't think a physicist uh, would tend to do because physicists will tend to want to talk about uh, trivalent vertices, um, uh, but that's okay. Uh, having put my momenta there and worked out the answer, then at the end, I can hope to specialize to where those external momenta are zero and uh, to see whether the general picture, which you'll see is, is, is quite, quite simple and nice, uh, specializes as well. So anyway, uh, that's the point of view that uh, I will adapt. Um, there, let me see. There, there's one other um, thing that uh, I, I, I don't seem to have written on this slide. Did I write another slide here? Um, let's, let's go to the next page. Maybe I wrote on the next page here. Um, yeah, so um, and again, an algebraic geometer confronted with this kind of problem tends to think of it in two parts. Uh, the amplitude is a relative uh, period. That is the chain of integration is not topologically closed. It bounds on the, on the where the coordinate hyperplanes are zero. Um, 
And that means that um, you, you're, it, it's a, it's a, that adds a, a, a complexity to the situation, which is not inherent in the, in the pure algebraic geometry of the second semantic hypersurface. Uh, so for an algebraic geometer, it's kind of natural to, to break down the problem of understanding two loop graphs into two parts. First of all, you try to understand the, um, the algebraic geometry of just the hypersurface itself. Uh, and understanding the algebraic geometry uh, means, uh, first of all, resolving the singularities of the second semantic hypersurface, and then uh, computing the motive, which is the, the middle dimensional cohomology of that non-singular uh, variety. Um, and I have to admit that early in my, uh, in my career that I, I sort of saw that as, as the whole story, but in fact, of course it's not because having done that, you next faced the problem of understanding the, the, the amplitude itself, which is not a, a, a period in the, in the pure sense, it's a relative period. Um, and there are two ways to think about these relative uh, periods, uh, and this is something that's sort of grown on me uh, only over the years. For one thing, uh, the work of Matt uh, Kerr in recent years uh, for the three or four banana graphs um, relates this relative period um, to uh, a uh, what's called motivic cohomology, and motivic cohomology is a, is a and a mathematical uh, theory uh, that sort of generalizes, it yields uh, what are called normal functions, which are um, periods, but they're relative periods. I mean, they're sort of, it's better they're functions which take values which are relative periods. Uh, sorry, I seem to have lost the thread here. So, um, these, the, there's a real gain. I mean, the, the thing is that the integral, the Feynman integral uh, is very complicated. Uh, I'm thinking now of the parameterized uh, version. It's very complicated because the chain of integration, first of all, is not topologically closed. And second of all, it, uh, um, it, it can meet the polar locus. Uh, and, and, and the whole thing is really something of a mess. Uh, so um, the hope would be to find some, to reach out beyond the integral, the integrand itself, and find some method to produce uh, the, the, the amplitude uh, from some other, from some other uh, ideas. And that, that's what Kerr has, done uh, in the context of the three or four banana graphs, which are, are simpler, I mean, in many ways simpler. Uh, and another consequence of, of, of this idea is that the motivic cohomology is related to Balenson conjectures. And these, are, this, these conjectures give nice uh, arithmetic interpretations of special values. Of, of these, uh, these functions. And uh, so there's the possibility of a nice uh, picture. Now, when you try to do this, uh, I can't do it, let me, make, let me be blunt. I can't go beyond where, where Kerr uh, went, um, but there's hope. And the, the hope is, uh, again, goes back to something that Dirk uh, explained to me over the years. Um, if you think about the banana graphs, for example, you uh, if you when you think about the banana graphs, um, you uh, think of momentum flow, and the second semantic of a banana graph is just the the, the product of the of the various uh, coordinates, and um, you you imagine topologically, if you think of the graph, you imagine cutting those edges. And um, so 
I've lost the thread here. So you, you want to uh, cut those edges. And the fact that that picture is so simple is what enables Kerr to, to make this relation between the Feynman uh, amplitude and uh, the, uh, the Balanson type uh, normal function construction. Um, but now if you take a more general graph, you have momentum flow, but momentum flow is kind of flowing in all kinds of different ways between you choose any two uh, vertices and you look at how the momentum flows between those vertices or more generally you choose uh, as you do when you construct the second semantic uh, uh, polynomial, you, you, you look at all ways of cutting the graph into two uh, simply connected pieces and how momentum can flow between the, the, the two uh, simply connected pieces. Um, and so the problem becomes one of generalizing the motivic homology construction, which if I have time, I'll say a few words about, uh, to situation where you have not just one cut, but, but uh, sort of a whole chaotic range of cuts. So anyway, that's the second, uh, what I want to spend most of the, the hour on, because I, I have actually some results on, is the first uh, problem, which is just understanding the, the, the motive, the, the pure motive that you get by resolving the second semantic and, and then uh, see, see what we can say about, about that pure uh, motive. Okay, so uh, I'm going to focus on the double box, uh, which I've drawn. Uh, over here, um, simply because that's where I have the best results. I have results also for um, uh, for the kite, which but the, the the kite is sort of simpler. You just contract the two uh, the two edges here and here. Um, so let me just focus on the, on the, the double box. So uh, again, as I say, I take the external momenta and masses all to be generic. And if you do that, um, the, the, uh, uh, the hypersurface is defined by a, a cubic in their seven edges, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, the seven edges. So it's a cubic in, in seven variables. And if you work it out, and this is the basic uh, thing is it's, um, it has this, this shape. I have Q, capital Q, and capital Q and capital Q prime are, are quadrics. They're degree two in, in three uh, variables. Here Q is an X5, X6, and X7. And I multiply it by the linear, by the, 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 just the sum of X1, X2, X3, X4. And then Q prime is another quadric, uh, this time in X1, X2, X3, and I, I multiply it by, by the others. And then I add a sort of uh, catch-all term, which is divisible by X4. So X4 is the guy in the middle here. Okay, so it's divisible by X4. And uh, you can write it this way as a, as a sort of, uh, you take a matrix where I've taken generic, uh, it's a four by four, uh, four, by four matrix uh, with generic entries, except that the lower left-hand corner here is zero. And then I just multiply by the row and column vectors as, as indicated. And, and then I multiply the whole mess uh, by, again, by X4. So uh, that means that F will have no uh, term in X4 cubed. We'll have some terms in X4 squared given by X4, and this will have linear terms in X4. So there will be terms in X4 squared, but not in X4 cubed. Okay, so what, uh, what can we say? Well, here we're gonna use the fact that everything is generic. We've taken all our parameters to be generic. And in that case, you, you easily check that the singularities of your X are a disjoint union of two uh, quadric, uh, two conic uh, uh, curves actually. So C and C prime are, um, are curves in, in P2. Okay. Um, 
it's a little complicated. P2, for example, is the, the P2 with parameters, uh, with coordinates x5, x6, x7. And then you, you set the x1, x2, x3, and x4 all to zero. So the singular, it's a little confusing because here you're taking a, a sum, but here you literally take the, the, the fellows equal to zero. And you work out that the singular locus of this expression is just this disjoint unit. Okay, so what happens then if I blow up these two conic curves? I blow them up in the ambient projective space, not in, in the singular x, but I blow them up in the ambient uh, uh, projective six space. So this is all happening. X is a fivefold, I should have said that in projective six space. So I blow these up in projective six space, and then the resulting uh, blow up, I call capital V. Uh, so it's birational uh, uh, with uh, B6, uh, and there are two uh, disjoint, uh, the blow up uh, are two disjoint uh, sort of smokestacks that stick up out of P6. And then I take, uh, and this is the standard game uh, for resolution singularities, I take the strict transform of my Y. So Y sits in P6 here. I take the strict transform, uh, sorry, not Y, it's X that sits in P6. I take its strict transform here, and then I get uh, Then I take its strict transform and I get a y uh, in, inside V. And then one easily checks, again, using this generic condition that this y is a resolution of singularities. Okay, so, um, so here is then the, the picture of the, uh, yeah, this, is the, this is the picture. And so y is the resolution. So we want to understand the motive associated to H5 of this smooth variety Y, okay? And um, what we want to show, it's not very well written here, but I hope you can read it, is that H5 of Y, just the, the cohomology of Y, is identified with the cohomology of a certain elliptic curve, H1 of an elliptic curve, uh, with a minus two twist. This has, uh, this has weight five. So the H1 of the elliptic curve has weight one. So I have to goose that up to get to weight five. So I twist by minus two, which has the effect of adding four uh, to, the, to the weight. So this, at least from the point of view of weights, this kind of identity makes sense. And so how can I show this? Well, let me first of all say that this elliptic curve is kind of mysterious. I've, I've talked a lot with uh, Pierre Van Hove about trying to figure out, and I, I think he can actually do it, but it was certainly six months ago since we, we've talked and he was kind of displaced by the virus as well. So uh, we, should, we should check again to, I th think he knows how to compute the elliptic curve in terms of the coordinates of y, but uh, I'm not hundred percent sure. But in any case, it, uh, it's an elliptic curve. And if we just say, okay, we wanna see that it's an elliptic curve, the basic thing that we have to do is we have simply to look at the Hodge structure, the Hodge filtration on this H5 of Y. And what we have to show, well, I mean, a little bit more, but the crucial thing is that the F3, the third Hodge uh, filtration level is one dimension because what will then happen is, is it that F2 will then be symmetric. So it will be two dimensional. And uh, uh, so that will then uh, be the whole story. Will, um, yeah, so this is, this is the crucial thing that has to be, has to be shown. Okay, so how, how does one uh, do this and one, one doesn't want to do anything special because one wants a machine that ultimately you can hope to apply to other two loop graphs. Um, and I will say, uh, if I have time at the end, how to generalize this, this, uh, this basic setup and, and the basic construction of the, of the Y. Um, 
So the first thing you remark is that Y sits in V, right? That's how we, we got it. Uh, and uh, by uh, the long exact sequence of cohomology, you can identify, uh, oh, and also the fact that V is very simple. V is gotten just by blowing up uh, qu uh, conic curves uh, in projective space. So, so the, the cohomology of V, it, there's no, um, it's all Hodge. And so there's no, no F4, which then tells you that F4 of the complement of Y is F3 of Y, which is the, we want to show this is one dimensional. So we need to calculate this. And now there's a classical and very powerful theory uh, due to Deleen and, and, and Simca, Simca, Simca is the car. Uh, uh, there's another author, I'm sorry, I've forgotten his name. Uh, something called the pole filtration, which deals exactly with the problem of calculating the, the Hodge structure on a complement of a, of a hypersurface in a, in a variety. Um, and what it tells you in this, in this is that you can calculate this uh, thing as a sort of hypercomology of a certain complex uh, where I look at four forms on, on V now uh, with single order poles. And then when you differentiate such a thing, you get a five form on V, but the pole order increases. And again, uh, like this. And so you get a complex here and the hypercomology in degree two of this complex is the relevant thing that's identified with this, and this is identified with the thing that should be one dimension. Okay, so now we come to an interesting problem in in, in, in how to present <laughs> mathematics. Um, the actual proof of this is quite complicated, uh, so I. I, I kind of despair of trying to explain it by, by Zoom. I do have a, uh, a letter that I wrote to uh, Matt Kerr and Pierre Van Hove uh, with the full details, uh, which I am willing to share, but not promiscuously, <laughs> uh, so to speak. So um, if anybody really seriously wants to work on this problem, I would be delighted and I would be happy to communicate this, this letter to them. But for the for the the masses, so to speak, I think it's best that we uh, we just uh, I'll, I'll explain some of the ideas, but I won't be able to give the full details. It's a it's a complicated linear algebra uh, story. Okay, but anyway, uh, let me stress again this pole order theorem that I, makes this identification. So now what we have to do is we have to identify this this. Uh, Thing which we can do uh, sort of piece by piece. And as I say, the full story is complicated, but at least we can look at the, the last piece here. So that, that is what I propose to do. Um, and there's no reason not to do this more, more, more generally. So instead of a double box, let's consider a double n guard. Okay. Now, um, well, how am I doing time-wise? Uh, can somebody tell me uh, when I'm supposed to stop? Uh, I think um, uh, at least until 20 pass or 15, 20 pass, I think that's certainly fine. Uh, okay, so uh, 17 pass, 17 and a half pass. <laughs> okay. Very good. Okay, so um, let's consider a more general double n gone. Um, then uh, such an X is in projective 2n minus 2 space. And the, the conics that we had before become general quadrics in n minus 1 variables. The story is, is, is very similar to what I explained already. You do the blow up again, you blow up the two, uh, the two quadrics where you set the other variables to 0. Uh, this gives two disjoint quadrics, and we get the same kind of story. And um, we define the 
omega 2n minus 2, that's the top dimensional cohomology, but with a tilde, and the tilde of, uh, sort of, it, it obeys Bloch's law, which says that always the most innocuous looking bit of any uh, uh, symbol is the most important. Uh, so the tilde means that these are sections. Uh, so with poles, two n minus two forms with, with some poles along x, but they have the property that when you pull them back to V, uh, they don't get any poles along E. So if I have here uh, a form on projective space with poles on X and I pull it back to V, a priori it can get some poles on, 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 on these E and E prime, but some of, the, some, of the, some of the sections don't, and these will be the tilde. So that's a tilde. And uh, these are the ones that compute uh, the, uh, the relevant uh, piece of uh, let's see, get back to the, the, the n piece here, uh, and uh, the proposition is in our case, that is in the case of the double n gon, this fellow here is one dimension, and that's good because that's exactly what we what we want. Because notice here we're interested in H2. So H2, this is a complex. So H2, the relevant pieces are H2 of this, H1 of this, and H0 of this. So the fact that that H0 is one dimensional, that's cool. That gives us exactly what we want. What the rest of it, it sort of becomes a question of showing that the, these guys don't come in and, uh, and mess up our nice, our nice, our nice one fellow that we, we've got here. Uh, so, so that's, that's uh, as much as I'm going to uh, say uh, about uh, the, the general uh, argument. Um, now, there is one further remark. Um, we, we, we like to look, uh, as I say, the, the, the game becomes to now understand uh, all two-loop graphs. And by all two loop graphs, I, I, I sort of think of them as triples, uh, where I take the um, the two banana graph, and I and I subdivide uh, the three edges. So the, the PQR graph, I have P edges up here, uh, Q edges in the middle, and R edges underneath. Okay, um, and empirically, I can say with some confidence that the, and the hard case, uh, the case where things are gonna be different um, is the case where P, Q, and R are all at least two. So that another way of saying that uh, is that's the case of a non-planar case. I mean, in other words, you see if, if, if I have this graph, I cannot connect this vertex to infinity without, without cutting through the, through, the, through the edge here. So that's a sort of non-planar. Uh, I mean, this of course is planar, but, but, but when I try to connect it to infinity, I can't do that in a planar way. So um, those empirically are, this is not gonna be true. Uh, this proposition is, is, is false uh, for the non-planar uh, guys. Um, but notice here, th th this is one. And I, I took the same number of edges for the, for the two things here, but I, I'm, I'm sure, I guess for some reason I didn't do the calculation, but I'm sure that it doesn't depend on the, on the numbers of edges. It simply means that one of the, one of the three uh, has to be left uh, in one piece. Um, okay, so, So the, then uh, more, more generally, um, uh, I want to describe uh, in, in closing uh, how to uh, set up the, the machinery. Um, and let's take the hardest case first. Uh, assume P, Q, and R are all at least two. Then you choose quadrics, uh, which I'll label Q sub 
P parentheses and Q sub Q parentheses and Q sub R parentheses in the indicated uh, variables and with general coefficients. And uh, I write FP to be Q sub P times the linear combination uh, as indicated from P plus one to P plus Q plus R and the same FQ uh, so all the omitted variables appear linearly in this, in this extra factor here, and fr. And then I have a, a fourth uh, term here, which I call fpqr, which is a generic linear combination of, of these, these fellows. Um, and then f is um, the, 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 the sum of these, of these these four terms. So notice here I've assumed that all of these are at least two. So this description does not work for, for the double end up. We need another, another description for that. But this then is the, is the, uh, the second semantic polynomial. And so what has to be done is to go through the linear algebra using the, uh, the pole filtration as, as I indicated and compute the, uh, the cohomology uh, in the middle degree of this resolved uh, hypersurface. Okay. So what am I doing here? Yeah, so uh, there are two uh, special cases, which are the cases that you know, I've already been talking about. So this is when you have one uh, edge in the middle uh, R equals one, then the, the, the thing uh, has the shape that I, I already indicated for the double box, again, with generic quadrics now, because P and Q are, are, can be larger. Um, and then the extra term is uh, divisible by XP plus Q plus one. XP plus Q plus one is the, is the, the single edge. That's the edge variable corresponding to the single edge, and it divides uh, all these all these fellows, and then finally there where I actually have two uh, edges that are left uncut, and uh, then the F has has uh, this shape here. Um, okay, so um, maybe I should say I have a few more minutes here. So maybe I can say a few more words about the, um, uh, yeah. So let me say a few words about the passing to the, the amplitude. And, and this is all completely uh, fantasy. Well, except that Matt, Matt Kerr has made it work in the case of the banana graphs, or at least the, the two and three banana graphs. Um, and so the, the game here involves, uh, as I said, uh, something called a motivic cohomology. And motivic cohomology is, um, I mean, I'm not gonna go through the, the details, but here's, here's an example. Um, I have my hypersurface X and I remove the, the loci where, where one or more of the uh, coordinate hyperplanes uh, meet uh, X. And so let me call that resulting thing X star. So on X star, I have what's called a tame symbol. That is, damn it. Is one problem with this thing is it jumps around. I have the tame symbol. That is these <clears throat> TI over TJs, and I put always T naught in the denominator, uh, are well-defined units. Uh, on X star because I've removed the, the zeros. Uh, so these are functions uh, with no zeros of poles on X star. And so such a, such a tuple uh, represents a class in the motivic cohomology of X star. Uh, and the, the indices are N, where they, they, notice they're N plus one capital T's, but, but I, I break symmetry by choosing a, one of them to be the denominator. And so I have N actual functions. 
here. And so I had n tuple of, of, of units, and that defines for me a class in motivic cohomology, uh, Hn with z of n twist. Um, so that's a whole uh, story in, in itself. Um, but we want something on all of x. We don't want just something on x star. And <clears throat> Matt has uh, developed a theory along with, uh, well, I'm not sure I should give him the whole credit. Uh, uh, there's, a, there's another name that escapes me who he, who he worked with. But in any case, um, they worked, uh, they developed a, a, a notion of tempered uh, hypersurface. And tempered means that this class, which I priori is defined as X star, actually lists to the whole motivic cohomology of X. And that's an interesting business. Uh, let me just say a few words because this is all in some mysterious way linked to the well-known properties of the second semantic polynomial with respect to contraction or, or, uh, or cutting uh, edges. Um, and the fact that uh, these classes extend is not a trivial fact and it's linked to the behavior of the polynomial, the second semantic polynomial under uh, edge contraction and, and so on. Um, but once you've gotten it to, to be a class uh, in motivic cohomology, then there, there is a, a, a numerical invariant associated to this class, a, a, so, to, so to speak, a cycle class, which in this case sits in the cohomology of X with C mod Z twisted by N uh, coefficients. So this is sort of a, a circle with a, with a twist uh, or else it's not a circle, it's C mod Z. It is C mod Z, it is what it is. Uh, but it maps, uh, if we sort of throw out the compact uh, piece of this thing, to the cohomology uh, with real coefficients with an N minus one twist. And this is the, this is the so-called cycle class. And this is the class which Kerr relates to the Feynman amplitude. The relation is not direct, it's complicated. And it's not as simple as one would hope. But this is the, in the banana graph, this is the thing that Kerr uh, uses. So the second step in my program here, which is to uh, pass from the pure motive of the hypersurface to the mixed uh, period, which is the Feynman amplitude, uh, revolves around understanding in some much deeper way, uh, just as the second semantic is, is built up out of these cutting, the various ways you can cut the graph into two pieces. Uh, in this particular case, in the banana case, there's only one way you can cut the graph into two pieces. And that's what makes this work. But suppose that we have the full complicated situation where there are many ways, then uh, the challenge is uh, to try to recreate the, uh, the Feynman amplitude from some sort of uh, analogous uh, motivic cohomology. Okay, so I, I, that's really all I want to say. Uh, I say congratulations to Dirk for, uh, for uh, living such a constructive life and uh, being lucky enough to be in Berlin where there are no virus cases. Uh, unlike the rest of us who are uh, Chicago at this moment is absolutely uh, horrible. Uh, I tell my wife not to go outside. But anyway, uh, thanks for the opportunity to talk. Thanks. Very Thank much. you very much. Thanks, Spencer. Uh, we had a question from Matt uh, under the participants. Karen, can you un unmute him? Because I can't seem to be able to do that. Yes. And I will fix your situation too. Yes, thank you. Uh, so I was curious, um, for the double box and on, you seem to be mostly describing the F polynomial. Unlike for the sunrise, of course, the U polynomial is also typically necessary even in integer dimensions to express these things. Is there a reason why you only consider the F polynomial? 
Um, well, so the F prime, yeah. So the, the, well, first of all, in how many dimensions, as you know, the, 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 the integrand, uh, the Feynman integrand is, it depends on, on what dimension of space time. Uh, but I take a dimension of space time where, where U is, so first of all, let me say that U is very simple uh, in, in, in this kind of case. Uh, let me see if I can explain that statement just a sec here. Um, yeah, yeah, so here, if you take the double n-gon, so let's, we want to compute the first semantic. Okay, so what is the first semantic? Well, we, we're looking at uh, pairs of edges. Uh, first of all, there are no coefficients. It's just uh, pairs of edges which cut this diagram, which when I remove them, uh, Disc, I mean, don't disconnect, but, but kill the, the loops in this two loop picture. Okay, so how can I kill the loops in this two loop picture? Well, one way is I cut one edge from one of the loops and one edge from the other. Okay. Uh, another way is I cut the guy in the middle here and then I just cut some other edge. Now, if you think about it, that's, that's the end of the, that, those are the only ways. So the, the first semantic then is just gonna be a sum of uh, those two kinds of uh, quadratic terms. One, which is divisible by this edge variable and then divisible, well, in fact, we can say what it is. It's this edge variable times the sum of all the other edge variables that will capture all the monomials of degree two that enter in that part. And then we have the other guy, which is the product of the, um, the, the sum of the edge variables in this loop, but not this one, and the sum of the edge variables in this loop. So in other words, I've written this quadric as really a sum of two terms. Uh, one, I mean, you see what I'm saying? Not, uh, so the algebraic geometry of the first semantic in this kind of situation is very, very simple. That's, that's the takeaway. I see, thank you. Mm -hmm. We had a question from David. Yes, Spencer, I just wanted to remark that your, um, your box diagram with those extra lines in the middle it's called a rail track diagram by people who work in gauge theories. They are far from generic because all of their internal masses are equal to zero. And they thought for a long while that will protect them from elliptic obstructions, that uh, they would evaluate in terms of multiple polar logarithms as a whole ethos built on that philosophy. But in fact, it's precisely that diagram where they encounter their first obstruction. And it's recently been related, uh, one of the authors is Matt uh, von Hippel uh -huh. uh, uh, to uh, a single integral of a perfectly explicable trilogarithm over the square root of a quartic. That's the So, uh, David, you said that all the masses are zero? Is that, all is the that internal right? masses are zero. Internal masses are yeah. zero. Uh, uh, the four external masses at the corners are non zero. Um, the uh, uh, the lines in the middle of the railway track, you, you, you can put equal to zero. And, and in that situation, the kinematics is enormously simplified because there are only a certain number of cross ratios that Matt will tell. I mean, I'm, I'm old fashioned when I say mass, I mean the mass terms as opposed to the momentum terms. So it, there still are mass terms, so to speak, along the tracks? No. Uh, not, the, not the railroad ties, but- No, the, no, the, 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 those are just gluons. They're completely massless. Ah, okay, <laughs> so we can't give- Blue on some mass just collapsed. No, no, it's far from generic, but what I'm saying is they have a perfectly explicit elliptic curve. They can calculate its via stress invariance, and it would be interesting to see in their non generic. This is for the box case, or this is the, more, uh, the double box case? Page four. Fantastic. Uh, so, so, uh huh. So, if this was an ordinary conference, David, we could meet in the hall and you could tell me more. But... <laughs> so, so, so your diagram is uh, I've heard about at at least three major conferences as the first place that gauge theorists, even N equals four super young mills and the planar limit, 
meet uh -huh. epileptic obstruction, and you've just sat down by pure thought and told them that in advance. Yeah, except that I can't tell you what the elliptic curve is. I mean, maybe maybe Pierre can. I, I'm hopeful that Pierre can when I can get well, a hold well, of it. Well, well okay. they, they can tell you in that simplified uh -huh. kinematic uh -huh. situation precisely cool. what the Weierstrass invariants of that elliptic curve are in terms of the... Cool. Uh, I mean, in can you point me toward a paper or...? or yeah, yeah, uh, I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll send you, it's published. I'll oh, okay, it. okay. If you get a chance, that would be beautiful. Yeah. Thanks. Seems to me like this is a perfect thing for a dinner conversation uh, <laughs> later on. So, what time is dinner? Can I? Well, we, we had planned it for uh, for just in, in eight minutes, but because we're behind, and I mean, people will have to get the dinner from somewhere. So, you know, it's Paris time dinner. So, um, okay. So, okay. And I would note that in the gather, some of the tables have whiteboards at them. So, if you Think you might want to talk math, including LaTeX on the whiteboard. You can pick a table that has a whiteboard. I have a very nice story about uh, Maxime giving a whiteboard talk uh, a week or so ago, and it was a beautiful talk. And the whole thing was lost at the end because the whiteboard turned white, <laughs> and nobody could recover the thing. So Maxime said, "That's okay," and he just wrote the talk out again. Wow. So, I think nothing in Gather gets lost. I think, I think everything. Uh, everybody lost. said that. Everybody said nothing. Nothing gets lost, but nobody could recover. <laughs> anyway, okay. okay for, for now, uh, let, let's say uh, thanks, Spencer, again for his nice talk.